Hello and welcome to Miniature Adventures and this week I wanted to discuss using house rules to enable solo play. So I often play solo games, I've been doing a lot, especially since I've had my operations room, um, and often the rule sets that I want to use to play a game don't include any solo rules within them. So this means taking the existing rule set making them work for the scenario that I want to play. So it means I've got to come up with adaptions to make that rule set work as a solo game. And I've actually found that in some ways it's often simpler than you may think. It doesn't always have to mean a ra major rewrite of a set of rules. Um, uh, very simple rules can transform a set of existing rules um, and make them workable as a solo game. Um, but I would go one step further and say if you're going to make introduce some house rules to adapt a set then why not think about also crafting bespoke changes that fit the unique scenarios that you want to play so i've always thought that when you get a, a commercial rule set and you bring it into your home no rule should be set in stone um, if you're not a competition gamer then all the limits disappear um, there's no restrictions on you and particularly if you're playing solo who's to tell you you're doing it wrong so what i would say to you is um, solo play especially benefits from being, having a flexible approach to the rule sets that you're going to use. Um, and while some rule sets will include stuff in there about solo play, lots don't. Most of the ones that I've read don't. Um, um, but whatever you do when you're crafting a, a, a bespoke set of rules or a, a amendments to make a game solo, be proportionate with what you're doing. Um, now I've categorised these into three broad areas um, that I tend to find myself considering whenever I'm trying to adapt a set of rules. Um, you know, how do you deal with scale changes? Because I'm often playing with different scales to the rule sets are designed for. Um, how do you AI the opponent? Now, that's obviously important if you want to actually be surprised when you're playing a solo game. Um, and how can you adapt the rules for a particular scenario that you want to play? So the easiest one of those is um, changes when you're changing the scale. So I, as anyone will know uh, that reads my blog or sees watch my channel will know that I play a lot of six millimeter. Uh, so one of the simplest changes you can make is um, instead of using inches, use centimeters. And that's particularly useful if your table is small. Now as everyone will know, my table isn't a full size table. I'm a bit restricted for space in here. Um, uh, and, and a lot of other people will be in the same. They'll be playing on dining room tables or, or in small rooms uh, within their homes. Not everyone has the luxury of a full-size table. Um, so that's a really easy rules change to make. As long as you're consistent and you apply it to all of the measurements and to both sides, then you're not going to break the rule system by changing from uh, to in centimetres instead of inches. Um, uh, but of course, you know, if you have a larger size table, then sticking with inches with smaller scales still works. It looks more realistic. Um, uh, whatever you do, try to be simple and consistent. Um, and always bear in mind, you know, keep it in the back of your head. Don't try to break the math behind the original rule set. So the, the fewer changes you can make, the better. Um, and, and obviously, as I've already mentioned, the changes should apply equally to both sides. Uh, um, so that there's no bias built into the way that you're applying house rules. And the important one is uh, to, to consider when coming up with adaptions for an existing rule set is how are you going to AI the enemy? Um, whatever you do, it should be measured and it should be realistic, but it should also generate some randomness because you want to be surprised. Um, so I will think of four different things when I'm trying to AI the enemy for a particular rule set. I will... Uh, try to automate an army's overall strategy, maybe weighted to hold historical behaviour, but nonetheless I'll be looking at their overall strategy. I'll be looking at the behaviour of individual units, so looking at their morale, their attitude, how aggressive they are, for instance. Um, I will try to randomise deployment. Now, that may mean uh, randomising one unit, which may change the direction that the enemy are attacking from, uh, or it may be randomising all of the units. It depends on the scenario and the rule set that I'm using. Um, and then the fourth element that I, I like to introduce is uh, random events. Um, now, this is something that I lift straight out of uh, role-playing games. Random event tables uh, are quite common in role-playing games. And, and I don't see any reason why you can't have something similar to that in, in a war game, because that way it surprises everyone, both you and the invisible player that you're playing against. Um, at, but whatever you do, when you're writing rules, these tables... 
don't go too wild um, with the options. I always try to keep the range of options on that table within realistic bounds. Now it might be weighted towards the historical behaviour of a particular army, particularly if you're playing a historical scenario, um, but there should be enough room either side for them to surprise you, to, to do something different than they did on the actual during the actual battle. Um, you know, for instance, I, I won't write a set of tables, uh, a set of actions, that enable a unit to suddenly do a U-turn for no apparent reason, or to ignore an obvious target, or uh, uh, objectives, for instance. It's just not realistic, and it's going to feel false. Um, yes, it's completely and utterly random, and you may be standing there scratching your head, but it just, just doesn't feel right to me, so I try to avoid that if all possible. Um, and let's face it, the randomness of the dice. The old dice gods will play with both sides and, and will create enough randomness on their own. Um, so, you know, by the time you've put in a little subtle changes through the, the looking at the strategy and behaviour, the deployment, and uh, some random events, throw in the randomness of the dice and you've got yourself some surprises coming up. Um, these simple changes will still produce an interesting game and will challenge the solo player, um, regardless of the rule set or the scenario that you're playing. Now, the last thing I try to do with house rules when solo playing is I try to uh, adapt to the scenario that I want to play, particularly if I'm playing a historical scenario. Um, so rules systems tend to be generic. Yeah? They're designed to work across the range of scenarios, but some historical battles just don't work like that. Rules crumble when faced with impossible odds. Um, most rules would not replicate the outcome of some famous battles, especially when solo playing is involved and you're, you're trying to automate everything. Uh, so I try to... Um, I, I will often write rules that are weighted towards historical events, but allow for a bit of variation. Uh, so so um, uh, you can, in theory, replicate the events of history, but there's enough room in there for the you, the, the living player, to be surprised, basically. Um, you may need um, to write specific rules for that scenario, but... Ultimately, what I'm trying to do is replicate history, but with a degree of unpredictability built in. Now, whether you're writing a completely new set of rules or adapting an existing set of rules for solo play, there's one thing you absolutely must do, and that is playtest. Um, any changes need to be tested to make sure that they work. Playtesting with actual models and actual dice is always better than trying to do it theoretical, in my opinion. Um, uh, you know, actual gameplay with models on the table and real dice can reveal problems you never even thought of. And it doesn't have to be a full game or, or even part of one. It can just be a particular encounter or a particular situation. So, so I always try to test the circumstances where the rules change would happen so that you're actually thinking it through and seeing how it will, it will affect a game. Test extreme examples. So as well as the routine encounters. So, you know, push the limits of how this rule is going to work. And that leads to the last point, which is test to destruction. To understand the absolute limits of the rules change that you're trying to introduce so that you don't get halfway through a really good game and then realise that your rule ain't working quite how you thought it was going to. So a quick look online shows a lot of people making house rules, either down the club or in friends groups. Um, so I'm not alone in doing this. And and having had a go at writing my own rules, um, uh, unsuccessfully, it may sound a bit of an ad, uh, it does give a clearer understanding of what is needed when you're trying to adapt an existing rule set. Um, I'd certainly recommend giving it a go. If nothing else, it's a really enjoyable thought exercise and helps you to understand the rule set that you're playing even better than you perhaps you originally did. So, as always, I'd say to you, please join in the conversation in the comments below or on my blog, Big Leagues Miniature Adventures. And if you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe and share. And if you want to keep up to date with, with weekly content from this channel, please tap the bell notification icon. So until next week, as always, stay safe, keep gaming and of course, keep rolling high.